Candyman Farewells of Flesh and Candyman Day of the Dead. Now I'm going to start this with a brief review of each of them separately, but the rest of this is going to be for people who've already watched the second one and or the third one. Farewell to the Flesh is a decent enough horror movie. It's incompatible with the first one and really only works if you see it as an alternate movie to it, a slightly different way of looking at the myth. It's filmed nicely enough, the acting is average, and it does have creepy moments and atmosphere. I wasn't personally particularly impressed, and I doubt it would have helped if it had been someone other than the Candyman, and as should come as no real surprise, it completely rapes what the first one was. But hey, if what you liked in the first one was Tony Todd killing people who say Candyman five times into a mirror, then go right ahead, this is more of that. Day of the Dead, on the other hand, is a piece of shit no matter how you look at it. The acting is absolutely atrocious, it's utterly uninspired, what there is of a storyline never really takes off, and it really just amounts to 90 minutes of the lead and a couple of other hot chicks going around looking hot and screaming. And then the death scenes, none of which are effective because we don't care about any of these people. It sort of tries to be creepy and build an atmosphere, but it fails to do either. Okay, so I'm now going to start to go into spoilers. I'm going to start with a couple of things that both of them did wrong that aren't completely spoilers for either of them. Both of them have Tony Todd spew lofty sounding that no one would ever listen to if it wasn't for his awesome voice delivering it. I mean, there are a handful of people who can just say anything and it'll sound good, and he's one of them. They show flashbacks to stuff that we already know happened because we found out in the first one. They open the movie with a weak retelling of the myth as gradually found out in the first one, Day of the Dead especially phones it in. They stick really closely to the rules, so often to have someone die, they have to write in some situation where they say Candyman to a mirror five times. And this is, with very few exceptions, quite awkward. And finally, they both spell things out that the first just very nicely hinted at. I'm sorry, but if the audience is stupid enough not to understand the first one, then send that money to education instead of funding a movie that adds absolutely nothing to the original, but in fact rather detracts from it. Okay, there are going to be spoilers for the first one here as well. Starting with Farewell to the Flesh. Okay, so at the end of the first one, Candyman may or may not still exist. Helen Lyle definitely now has myth of her own. If you ask me, Personally, I don't think he still exists. I think she destroyed his myth and became one of her own. Anyway, just for the sake of argument, and because the, this movie would not exist at all if he didn't still exist, let's just go with that he does still exist, and this is taking place somewhat independently of the first one, in spite of the fact that very directly references the first one. We've got this family where Certainly the men in the family are obsessed with the Candyman. Now, as we find out, that's at least partially because they are his descendants. So apparently the father, the night he died, looked into a mirror and said Candyman five times. Why? What the fuck was he expecting to gain? Why didn't he get that mirror? It didn't take the lead very long to do so. Why does the brother seek out the professor at the beginning? What is he expecting to gain? I mean, let me reiterate, the point here is that these two men desperately wanted to defend the women in the family from Candyman. So one of them gets himself killed and the other gets himself thrown in jail and eventually killed. Other than convenience for the script, why? Also, let me just take a moment to express my immense displeasure with this whole they're related bullshit. Can someone explain to me why that's so fascinating to some writers? It happened in the Halloween franchise too. As of the second one, there's a relative of Michael's in nearly every single movie. In both cases, taking it from this entity could kill anyone anywhere to better hope you're not related to this one. 
How is that scary? Most people aren't going to be related to them. Why does the little girl whose acting is abominable, by the way, at the end even say Candyman four and a half times? You know, it would have been five, but then the mother, the lead, stops her. Where does she get that from? Who puts a mirror over a child's bed like that? Especially when there is the danger that if the kid says Candyman five times, you know, why do we need to see flashbacks to Robotile's death? And don't get me wrong, that didn't completely suck. The one thing they did right there, in my opinion, was seeing the children who were there and who clearly weren't sympathizing with him. That was good. Because there they show that he is just this image of evil. They take pleasure in tormenting him because to them, he's not as good as them. And if you ask me, that is the background for things like that. Every single ethnic cleansing, the witch hunts, the holocaust, everything in our history like that. But they then have the characters say all these things that we later come to connect with the Candyman, making it seem as if the myth has not evolved at all in all the years. And that's ludicrous. Calling him Candyman, the sweets to the sweet, anyone who knows anything about the tradition of oral storytelling will tell you that a story does not sound the same every time someone tells it, especially in the days of oral storytelling. And since we're talking about the myth of the Candyman, it would most likely be told to other people, not written down. It would go from person to person in villages and such by way of gossip. And gossip, believe it or not, does not always get the facts completely the way they were. The first one didn't follow the you have to say his name into a mirror five times rule religiously. Think for example of the doctor in front of Helen that he kills to release her. So it gets a free pass on this, but this does. So I have to wonder, what if you say it four times and then later on you pass a mirror and then say it once more? How much of a pause can you leave in between the five mentions of his name? Is the effect of him killing you increased if you're in a hall of mirrors? What if you're practicing a speech that happens to mention Candyman's name five times in front of a mirror? Will he still come and get you, or will he let you off the hook, so to speak, since you said other words in between them? Will it even work if you don't know about him? Is he internationally available so that if you say the word Candyman in a different language into a mirror somewhere in the world, he'll still come and get you? What if you say his name five times in five different languages? Would it have the same effect if you sang his name five times? If your jaw is wired shut from an operation and you can say it but it'll be unintelligible, will it still work? The part where she rips his face open and bees come out is decent enough creative-wise, but the effects are horrible. Seriously, no one could possibly have believed that that was really Tony Todd's face. A lot of these kids are following other gods, and I won't let that happen to my son. Except he's already built the shrine, so I kind of fucked up on that. Did anybody else catch that Candyman literally said the following two lines in a row? You can't fight what is meant to be. The choice will be yours, Annie. Um, those two lines contradict each other. The film is utterly predictable. Did anybody else half expect Cartwright to, at some point, say to her daughter, Don't worry, I'm a bit of an expert on attacks that consist of something protruding through a person's chest. Come, Annie, and listen to the song of misery. Or, as mortals call it, the latest single by Paris Hilton. What is Candyman even after in this one? So, why was his soul trapped in her mirror, anyway? Why didn't he try to stop her? All he did was talk to her. Am I the only one who could not stand Kingfish? You know, that radio DJ? God, he was irritating. The guy just would not shut up. Personally, I think it's really stupid that they could tell from the surveillance cameras that there was a supernatural force in that room. 